I didn't bring my baseball bat that says, you know, the inscription on my baseball bat at home actually says information security motivational device. <laughs> and it actually works pretty good. So this is Bruce Marshall. He's been with us before. And he has the website, his website is passwordresearch.com. And I always refer to Bruce as our, like, you know, the world community of password crackers. I always refer to Bruce as our personal librarian. If you're looking for a paper that has anything to do with passwords and authentication, he probably have that paper on his website, and he can tell you exactly what you need for your PhD or whatever it is. And by that, Bruce. Thanks, Bear. Yeah. Uh, as he mentioned, I was here uh, last year, got to speak about password. Well, he actually spoke about security questions at the Passwords 13 conference and what happens um, looking at some password database dumps that included security questions, what happened when people are left to write their own and how that's generally a pretty terrible thing. Uh, but my first password experience in Las Vegas was actually in 1996. I was at DEF CON 4, and uh, it was very early in my career. I was still learning a lot about information security. And I decided on the DEF CON network, which was mostly people bringing hubs and cables and stringing things together, that I wanted to log in and check my email while I was there. And I decided that Telnet was the way to do this. Uh, this is before the wall of sheep, and this was, like I said, I didn't have a quite the best grasp of what that meant. I knew that Telnet could expose your password, but here was my thinking. I figured if I type the wrong password in twice, and then type my right password in, they won't get to the point where they, they try that one, so I'll, I'll be good. Uh, as you might guess, within about a week's time, someone logged, logged into my account, and Luckily, it uh, uh, didn't cause too much damage. But that was an important lesson for me in passwords and passwords exposure to risk and uh, something we're, we're going to talk a little bit more detail to about today, specifically with password expiration as a way to manage that. Um, I'm going to ask for a very basic level of participation, if you don't mind. Is that not plugged in? Hmm. It may not, be, may not be super loud, but it is on. We'll see if that, I don't know if that will help at all. Um, just with a show of hands, and I'm not going to call anybody specifically, so you don't have to worry about being embarrassed, but who here already has uh, what they can consider a fairly set opinion on password expiration, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's useful, just with a raise of hands. Okay? All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we'll see if my expectations meet yours and vice versa. So we pretty much all, we'll start with kind of the basics here and go into specifically some studies on passwords and password uh, history. But we kind of have, uh, starting kind of at a top level, we can probably all agree, which is where if, if you have a password that's compromised, it needs to be changed. Password expiration kind of pushes into the areas of the next two steps below, which is a little bit more controversial to probably more controversial, which is if you suspect it could have been like you think that someone, something looks strange on your account when you log in. Or if you uh, see some other signs, that's a good time to change your password. Probably, again, not terribly controversial. Um, and then finally, when, you know, it's just been, you've used it long enough. It's been out there in the world. You've telling that it in from DEF CON. Uh, you don't know for sure that it's been compromised, but there's a good chance of it. Um, if just that chance has, if there's just enough of that chance, that, that should be, that should be a, a reason to change it. Um, and that's, again, probably what we're, we're here to talk about today as far as being the more controversial of those options. Of course, there's one more that's not on here, which is after the password's been used once, you should change it, in which case you're probably looking at a product, uh, technical product that's going to implement that for you. So I don't know how well you guys can see that, but I kind of tried to outline over the time of the password, um, the, the pit differs from password to password, system to system. You've kind of got this timeline of, of exposure, this timeline of risk, that changes when it talks, uh, when you, just by going through the regular use that each user is going to have specific to theirs. So I've got, you know, the top example here, which is on this day, I think July 1st, the user selects a password, they write down the password so they can remember it, and then they log in for the first time with the password. The next day, same thing, it's a little bit covered up here, but they log in with the password. Day three, they mistype their password, they're not really paying attention, just typing in, and they accidentally type it in the username box. 
you're going to have this lifetime of, of different exposures that can happen that may or may not cause that password to be compromised, but definitely increase the likelihood of that happening. Um, of course, other passwords, I've got systems that are very similar to this one where you go maybe logging in only every couple months. There aren't really any suspicious activities or you're not going coming from somewhere that's an untrusted network. You're not writing that password down or sharing it with anybody. So there's, there's differences when it comes to the passwords and the threats we face. And a lot of times when it comes to password expiration, as we'll talk about, we focus a lot on password cracking as that threat. And as I've kind of tried to basically show here, password cracking, of course, isn't the only threat we have to worry about. Um, it's just one of the easier ones to measure. So the, the question is, if someone knows that they've done something suspicious, you know, logging in from DEF CON over, over Telnet, um, and someone advised me of that or advised a person of that, are they going to change their password? And there's been a couple studies on this. One's, I guess, Cyber Systems, I think, is one of our sponsors here. They did a study last, uh, two years ago, where they actually just surveyed people. They asked them, hey, if you were in this situation where uh, a system you were using, probably on the internet, had been hacked, how long do you wait before changing your password? And so they surveyed what people, you know, what, what their responses were. Like all good surveys, you know, it's kind of take it with a grain of salt. People either sometimes think they're going to do something that they really wouldn't do when it comes down to it. Um, but we also have data on how that really plays out. Earlier this year, the University of Delaware, um, as a response to the Heartbleed issue, because they had some vulnerable servers, decided that they would email their, their students and staff and say, please change your primary network password. Um, after two weeks, after sending that email out, they had several thousand students and staff that had complied. Um, but as you can see here, they had about 57% of those of the student body and staff uh, left that hadn't changed their passwords. And you know, I would, depending on you know the situation, I might be among my among that group. But there was passwords I didn't go out and change all my passwords on the internet when Heartbleed came out, unless there was some significant risk. Um, but it does show, again, that sometimes people, even when told to do certain things for what they may, from an authority figure, they're not always going to comply. Um, and then finally, the eBay ex breach that happened earlier this year, where they're encrypted and hashed, or however you want to interpret that, um, security password database was, was breached. Again, customers weren't forced to change their password. They were emailed at their registered email account and asked to change their password. Um, this is a little bit, this is a little bit uh, maybe CEO speak when it comes to what this really means, but essentially their CEO said, CEO said about nine weeks after the breach that 85% of their buyers who are responsible for, or the buyers representing 85% of their volume of, of purchases had changed their password. So it's essentially the people that are on there the most making the most purchases. Uh, people like me that hardly ever get on eBay not among that group. So you kind of have a feel for, yes, sometimes people are going to cooperate, uh, especially when they're specifically told that they their password has been compromised or has been at risk, but it's not a perfect solution. So that's where, well, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit then about the, the timelines. How long in some different types of scenarios do you have to change your password or do you have to notice that there's a breach and know that you need to change your password? So we'll go over a few of those. Um, the Onion, America's finest news source, had a uh, little incident with the Syrian Electronic Army last year where they, a couple of their employees fell victim to a phishing attack. So first day, Syrian Electronic Army people sent out emails to several uh, Onion staffers to go to this website, and then once they got to the website, they were prompted for their Google app credentials. Only one person, according to the Onion, then went, later went and wrote this up, which is how we have this information. Uh, but only one person responded to that. But because of that, they were able to get into that person's account. And then from the internal email through Google Apps, they were able to send out more phishing emails that looked a little bit more convincing, came from a more trusted source, uh, and they were able to get further um, account compromise. Now, the dates on here, I'm not exactly sure of. They didn't specifically, they, they blogged about this, they didn't specifically label what the time frame was, but at the end, the Suggestion seems to be that it was within a very short time frame. So maybe that day, maybe the next day. Uh, but again, some, they basically got into social media accounts because they had access to the people's accounts from there. And then even after 
the Onion staff had realized that there was a compromise going on and sent out emails to people saying, reset your password, the SEA actually forged a copy of that message to send it to everybody but IT and said, yes, reset your password, go to this link to do it. And that was allowed them further continued access to the uh, social media account. So that's a very short, you know, within a couple days time frame of they were standing fairly on top of uh, getting the credentials, using the credentials, escalating the attack. Um, another example is uh, a couple years ago in 2012, the South Carolina Department of Revenue um, was hit with an attack that Mandiant had written up and kind of provided some detail on that. Uh, again, it started with a phishing attack sent to employees. The credentials that they got from that phishing attack, uh, at least one set they were able to use to get into the internal network then and start looking around the network. But it took them around 15 days according to the logs and the records that, they, that Manning had access to. Um, within another couple of days, they stole more passwords. And then finally on, on day 20, they, they stole probably the Active Directory password database. And then also finally got that backdoor installed. Um, and this is an important distinction, too, because in, in sometimes when you hear about uh, people protesting password expiration, they say, well, it doesn't make sense to have password expiration because as soon as they get in, they're going to install the back door. Well, that's not always possible. I mean, that's, that's a very valid point. In some cases and other cases, there's no back doors to be installed. Limiting their continued access is going to have some value. Finally, kind of worst case scenario. Uh, this was a few, a few years ago back at the uh, Israel Institute of Technology. One of the directors for one of their centers there uh, had a password, and I guess in some sort of a news article, a hacker was showing off that he had these elite skills, and so he showed how he could log into this person's pass, uh, this person's uh, university account. Apparently, the reporter followed up with the director and, and did confirm that it's been four years, that apparently the hacker just been holding on to it. Maybe he'd been logging in, reading email, didn't go into details on, on what was actually happening in that time frame, but there wasn't an active, noticeable attack during that time. Otherwise, she probably would have changed her password. So different scenarios, we try, in many cases, to try to deal with all of those using password expiration as, as a primary lines of defense, or one of our lines of defense, defenses. And there's really two goals we try to accomplish with, with password cracking, uh, or excuse me, password expiration. The first is that we want this to occur before the compromise happens, ideally. Now, that's not always possible, um, certainly password of course, password expiration is also a step in, in incident response plans if you want to make sure that the attackers no longer have access to the passwords. Um, the secondary goal that's also very important and that we're going to be going into a little bit more detail today on is you don't want the new password to be so similar to the old one that you really haven't gained anything with forcing people to change it. And that's a little bit harder, especially to, to enforce from a, from a security standpoint. Um, as you guys probably know, most of these are enforced through policies uh, within the software. Um, usually it's set for a certain time, so 90 days, six months. There's occasionally, very rarely, I'll see systems that say you have a limited number of uses, maybe 100 logins before you have to change your password or something like that. There's also two ways to implement it from a how do you get people to expire their or change their passwords. You can either give them... Uh, what's called a grace login. So like with Windows Active Directory, if I, my password expires, I can still log in with that password. I'm just forced immediately to change it. That's kind of a grace login standpoint. Um, that tends to preserve usability more because people aren't getting completely locked out. They have that opportunity to log in and set their password up. But of course, that also, if there was a reason you wanted them to not log in with that password anymore, you've kind of extended that security boundary maybe past what you're really comfortable with. Um, but of course, the downside of the other approach, we are blocking them out completely if they haven't changed their password by that point, is that you have to communicate that up front very well, and you also have people that are not going to do it, and you're going to have help, more help desk or, or self-service uh, calls related to that. Typically, because you introduce password expiration, there's some other controls that kind of go along with them. Password history is one of those. You don't have to have password history if you're forcing users to type in their current password and their new password at the same time. The system can do some checking between those two without storing the old one in a history somewhere. Um, but generally, if you're more serious about making sure people aren't reusing passwords, which we don't want them to do, um, you are going to be storing those passwords, either usually hashed, uh, within your account database somewhere. And then when they change those passwords, you're checking against all your hashing, hashing what they chose, 
and check it in against all those other previous results to see if they're if they are indeed using something that they shouldn't have, they've already used before. Sometimes this will be you know four times. Sometimes people will just say, hey, we want to prevent them from reusing passwords for a year. Beyond that, we don't really care. Um, it really depends on the implementation. Minimum password age is another one of those you'd think doesn't make a lot of sense uh, until you realize that once password expiration was introduced and password histories came into play, now a few people, probably not very many, are looking for ways to get around that. And what they were doing was essentially if their password history was 10 passwords, they would change their password 10 times to get back to what they had, you know, push everything out of the password history stack, and then get back to their original password. Like I said, whether that was just the technologically knowledgeable crowd that was doing that, I don't think a lot of people were. But So this essentially says you can set it a day, you have to wait a day before a person can change their password. And again, some people have criticized that from a security standpoint, saying, um, well, if something did happen in that time frame of them changing their password within a day, uh, they can't lock someone out of their account. Probably not a very likely scenario, but it could happen. And finally, the change notifications. This is... The idea behind this is to give users a chance to say, I'm going to change my password when it's convenient with me within this window, within this notification window. So if it's two weeks or if it's a week, they're going to have the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't want to wait till Monday morning, first thing, to change my password. I'm going to take care of it today, and then I'll, it'll be out of the way, and I don't want to worry about it. Especially when you have the account lockout, if they reach the password expiration date, this becomes very important. And NIST, uh, the NIST, one of the NIST password uh, management documents we'll talk about here in a few minutes, also really strongly recommends this. But the idea that people, some people have recommend, uh, have suggested that this notification gives people time to like start this creative process of coming up with a new password, which I'm not sure really takes that. I mean, it, it's not really something you start and think about and kind of mull over for a long time. It pretty much happens within a few minutes when, once you're finally making the decision to change it. So where do some of the guidelines, uh, what are some of the popular sources of, uh, that say we should enforce password expiration? And while it wasn't the first, it was one of the better documented ones and certainly became one of the earliest ones, which was the U.S. Department of Defense's uh, Password Management Guide, which is the green, line green book in the Rainbow Book series. Um, they essentially kind of established that, first of all, yes, you should change passwords before they are compromised before the probability of compromise, and they also kind of establish the idea of working out a maximum lifetime. And they actually say, hey, one year is probably sufficient in most cases. And for us to think, you know, hey, 30 days or 90 days or whatever, it seems like that's a big change. Um, but also the time, of course, 1985 was when this came out. Times were very different back then. Uh, in fact, if you look at the appendix where they're calculating how strong the password should be and how long the lifetime should be, they're making calculations based on the number of possibilities, of course, which is still something we do today. You know, if you have eight character password, of uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols, um, how many probabilities you have to guess before you get through that complete set. Um, but they were doing it figuring a 300 baud and a 1200 baud modem, which gives you about 8.5 and 14 guesses per minute. It's very different from the 10 billion guesses per second we can get now with, if we're actually talking about password cracking as opposed to online. Uh, password guessing. Even online password guessing is faster than that. So that established the baseline, um, but we've had other organizations that have kind of picked up on the idea of password aging and, and throwing in their own two cents on, on how it should be done. And I'll, I don't want to exhaustively go over these, but we'll kind of touch on some highlights of some of the more popular ones. Uh, when Windows 2000, Windows NT4 had password expiration in it, but there wasn't a default. You set essentially what value you wanted when you enabled that policy. Um, 2000 was the same way. It was off by default, but it defaulted to 42 days once you turned it on, unless you chose to change it. And they had a little bit of uh, fractured uh, feedback when it came to the way that they suggested what what was the suggested value for that. Depending on what source you looked at, um, one of their papers, and of course the default was 42. Others said, you know, hey, you're good with 90 if you're in high security, 180 if you're not. Some said 70. So. Wasn't that, I'm, I'm sure since then they've kind of gotten a little bit better about standardizing their advice, but that was a big pressure, especially for organizations in corporate environments moving to password expiration. It made it very easy to get uh, on board with some of those values. A couple others, the PCI Council for people who deal with uh, bank cards, the, the major brands. Um, 
not the users themselves. So my Amazon, if I log into Amazon, sort of credit card, uh, I'm not changing my password every 90 days, but the people that manage those systems are supposed to in, in certain cases, depending on what type of uh, structure they fit into the PCI standards. SANS also had uh, in their critical security controls that they introduced in 2009 and they continue to update. Since then, they say at least 90 days, but they do say something down at the bottom, which kind of mimics what we saw with the uh, the uh, Green Book Password Management Guidelines, which is that you should still customize this based on uh, your specific organization's environments. 90 days should be what you start with. If you have the manpower and knowledge to especially to say, hey, we don't 90 days is too often or not often enough, um, you should be able to customize it from there and still be you know, in compliance with this control. HIPAA, which is a healthcare regulation in the United States on dealing with records and, and uh, data exchanges, um, in the actual law, there's nothing about specific about passwords, but in the ruling, one of the guidance documents that the uh, Health and Human Services oh. okay, hack myself. Thought I screwed that in. They again kind of say nothing specific. They don't say 90 days. They don't say 180 days, but they do say that it should happen on a periodic basis. Um, that's something they're expecting those organizations that are required to comply with HIPAA to, to implement. Uh oh. That's interesting. All right. OWASP kind of, uh, you know, the, the, if you're not familiar with them, they're an organization that focuses on web application security. Um, they do have a document that, which is intended for developers and, and people that are assessing web applications primarily, but any, any applications would, would work, that they should have an, a, a, a capability within any product or software to verify that password, passwords can expire after a certain amount of time. Um, they're not, again, specific. They don't say that it has to be 90 days, but they do say that that functionality should be available on the application to be used. The website, which is a wiki, so anybody can really go edit it, uh, it says, you know, of course, we're all in agreement that this is important. Um, if you disagree with that, you're welcome to go change their mind on it. FFIC is the organization which uh, deals with banking regulation in the United States. And they have an IT examiner's handbook, which is then used by their assessors and the OCC, state regulators, and people like that. But um, you can kind of see, too, as I've kind of gone through these, I've arranged them so that you get from very specific guidance to kind of, well, you should do this, but it's not necessarily specific on how you should implement it. Um, but they just basically say you should implement a schedule to change them on a, on a set schedule. The NIST um, document that I mentioned earlier, um, the standard they basically set on how organizations should manage passwords. And again, they, they tend to have a very good balanced approach to this, which is that you need to decide whether that's important for you. But they also have to say something that's very important um, that I don't see in a lot of organizations that I've assessed and, and done work with, which is having separate password policies depending on what type of application you're trying to implement that policy in. What I normally see is one corporate information security policy that says 90 days or it says 180 days. Um, it doesn't say, hey, for the system that you hardly ever log into, which is always over HTTPS and, you know, it's an internal system, that this, this policy is different from uh, your primary domain login or something like that. Of course, uh, the ISO... 17799, the old policy that was based off the BS7799. Um, I have this in the older one in here just to show you the difference between this and the current uh, policy. It's, the language has changed a little bit. Um, there's two sections that really apply it to password expiration. One is that the first section, which is that they say users should be told to change passwords at regular intervals. And the other one is that they, the, the password management system should enforce password changes. If we look at the upgraded version of that, the replacement version, 27002, first of all, they removed the language uh, from the section that previously told users they should be changing their passwords regularly. And they also added the words, as needed, 
at the end of that system. So to me, that's lightening up the language a little bit, making it a little bit more acceptable not to implement, not to force organizations to implement password aging if they want to comply with the standard. There's several others. Um, you know, the IRS has one for, the, for themselves and for state agencies that process taxes. There's one for energy regulation. Um, anybody familiar with COVID? Do you, does anybody know what, if COBIT has specific guidance on what passwords expiration should be? I didn't get a copy of it. That'd be the only other one that people bring that in for SOX audits and things. That I'm not sure if that has specific guidance on it. But um, it's not just the standards that we're kind of buying into the idea of password expiration, but there was a paper, uh, the analysis of end user security behaviors back in 2004, which surveyed grad students in, essentially in, in IT and asking them to rate different behaviors, everything from installing Trojan on my on my computer to um, you know leaving my laptop unlocked when I walk away from it. Um, but when they look, when they evaluated the statement of didn't change their password for over two years, just that that was the only context they got. Eighty percent of them said that that was a naive, naive mistake. Um, the other twenty percent either didn't agree or rated it you know not a mistake or or something else. So it's kind of interesting how uh, you know we and I'm going to go into a little bit more, but how we've kind of had different perspectives on whether this is a good control or whether this is a bad control. One of the challenges we have with password expiration, and certainly with other things within information security, is that we don't have really the data we need to make some good decisions about how effective this is as a control. Um, ideally, we want to know how often has this password policy forced a password change, which then either prevented an attack from happening or limited the amount of time that an attacker had access to to get into the system. So if we look at this from a Venn diagram perspective of the time where the password is valid versus the time that an attacker has not only the password but also has the motive, access, skills, you know, if you want to look at the scram model, to, to actually use that password, what we probably hope is that there's very little overlap, that, that, that those password expirations are working great, the passwords are getting cycled out fast enough that we're not having much damage. The reality is it's probably more like this, but we don't know for sure. I mean, we don't have data that says we, that we have any real way to judge the effectiveness of the control. So it's, it's anecdotes, it's guessing, it's looking at what little data we have, you know, the success of phishing attacks and things um, to try to make, make sense of whether this is helpful or not. So what does the average person, the people we're implementing these policies to protect, think about changing passwords. And it's kind of funny how this is split. Um, one study from Jane Rain said that basically 38% would rather do some household chore, scrub the toilets, you know, clean the oven out, than come up with a new username and password. Um, and, and that's not specific to passwords, but it's, it is certainly, I'm sure that, that sentiment is shared. Um, the other 38% think that if they don't see a website with password expiration, that that's a sign that this website's not as secure as the other websites. So you've kind of got two ends of the spectrum here, the people that look at that as a, as a valid security mechanism and they, they hope to see it, and the people that would really not like to change their passwords as, as long as possible. I really like, this is um, something I found last year and I thought was a great example. I love that the, the open nature of, of social media where you get people's stream of thoughts and. Uh, confessionals about their different security practices, but um, it kind of reflects how some people and, and likely a majority of people have dealt with some types of password expiration, which is not to take it as, even though they think it's, hey, we've got to change passwords, it's probably for a good security reason, they're not looking at that second goal of making sure the password that they're choosing is different enough from their old password. Um, so I captured several of those of people their reflections on their own ways of going about changing passwords and what their thoughts were on that. It's possible that someone can believe it's necessary and still prefer cleaning toilets to doing it. That's true. They they may have they they may buy into it, but just not want to actually experience that uh, that work themselves. Now, notice here that two of these say OSU. We'll come back to that here in a little while. So I kind of, uh, you know, over the years I've seen a few things here and there about people kind of protesting password expiration and, and what their thoughts were on it. But I wanted to kind of backtrack through the years, you know, back through the last 20, 30 years of, of 
modern, you know, implementations of passwords and look at when did people start objecting to password expiration. It actually didn't take me very long, starting back at the beginning, um, even before the the, the uh, Lime Green book came out and the Unix system operating Unix operating system security book. Um, Fred Gramp and Robert Moore Sr. were already kind of picking at at least the implementation of the password expiration mechanism that they had in those systems. And there were some very specific complaints about the way that Unix was implementing those, not so much um, applicable to every implementation, but they did have some concerns about just how useful it was as a whole. Um, Fred Cohen from uh, Sandia National Labs and also kind of uh, from the antivirus community um, had similar thoughts in 1997 where he looked at uh, there wasn't much value being provided by these password expiration policies that we were we were implementing them we were putting them in place but there wasn't much payoff from doing that kept looking found a lot of different support um, and I'm not going to go through each one of these but a lot of these shared the same sentiments that either the password the problem with password expiration was it was happening too frequently it was causing inconvenience in users to the point that they were getting frustrated with, while providing very little value. People were choosing easily guessed passwords as a replacement. People were writing down their passwords. Um, let's see if there's any specific. I think Gene Spaffers was probably one of the first very detailed um, kind of stepping through the different problems with password expiration. But I did think it was very interesting that it was Gartner. Gartner here of course, very big in the business, some parts of the business community as far as their, their knowledge and wisdom, but they had written back in 2005 that there were a lot of security practices that were different from, or more effective, more value than, than what password agent. And in fact, I think they, they make a statement somewhat to the effect of there's a 0.9 probability that password agent is not going to provide you any value. And, you know, whether that's, whether you believe that has a solid basis in reality, um, it was saying a lot for them to, to come out and say that. Some more resources here coming up into a, to, to the more recent years. But despite all this, a lot, of it, a lot of what they were saying was either logical arguments, which is fine in some cases, or they were anecdotes about, I'm seeing people write down, you know, they're just incrementing the numbers at the end, or I'm seeing this, I'm, I, I don't believe this, which was great. Um, but it wasn't really until 2010 when the, um, some, some researchers at the University of North Carolina were actually able to get a hold of data and then look at what real choices were people making if, if, if looking at password expiration and looking at the, the password choices that they've had in the past. And this was actually a really interesting um, chance. They, they looked at disabled accounts in their environment, so probably most likely students at this university, uh, that had password history enabled. I think that password history did get up to 15 for some accounts, but the majority of the passwords they had access to, the accounts they had access to only had four to six uh, passwords stored. But that's still a pretty good variety to look into. At the university, they had changed passwords every three months, and they did have some basic password complexity uh, enforced for the people that were changing their passwords. So what did they find? They, they First of all, they had to crack the passwords, which that, that, um, that does have some caveats to it, because they're only analyzing the passwords they could crack. Of course, the more stronger passwords, it might skew these results in a more positive way. They weren't able to analyze as many of those, but they did a fairly good job of cracking what they had. Uh, and then they took those and they used transform-based, you know, basically regular expressions uh, to say, okay, we have the current password, or, you know, password one, password x minus one, password x minus two, so on and so forth. How are these related? Can we do, uh, can we create these transforms of doing simple things like substituting a one for a two and find the new password value? And they found that after coming up with all sorts of, you know, around, I think it's a little bit less than 550 transforms, everything from substituting numbers to inserting things to elite speak translations, pretty much what you see in a lot of password cracking filters these days, um, that 41% of the new passwords that they had access to could be broken um, fairly easily. Like I said, 550 guesses. This isn't millions and millions of different cracking attempts, just knowing what the old password was. And then maybe in a more practical, and this was, they, at the time, they said this was about three seconds. If you're doing offline cracking, that was about three seconds of work per account. But if you're doing online guessing, password guessing, and you have someone's previous account, previous, previous password, by using the most popular substitutions, which I believe all were number incrementing, number incrementing uh, they were able to 
still get 17% of, of passwords um, across the accounts they analyzed. So that was pretty important. The pro one of the problems of this paper, or one of the, my, my perceived problems of this paper was uh, it had lots of Greek symbols in it. It had lots of tables of, of data. It had lots of um, information which was not easily digestible by the, by the average IT practitioner. So while they did have summaries of things like this, you had to really dig through the paper and it wasn't as easily relatable to, to the average person. So that'd be my one critique of the paper, but it was great data that they, that they shared. So I have a little bit of data that I'm going to be able to share of some, some passwords that I've looked at in two different environments. Um, I unfortunately haven't gotten quite to the point where I have as much detail as what they had in the, the UNC case study, but I'm working towards that point. Um, there's one environment where I was able to go back three times uh, over a three-year period, actually on the same month every year, extract the passwords, crack the passwords. The nice thing about this being an active directory environment was uh, they had landman hashes enabled, NTLM, you can essentially crack 99%, you know, 100% of the passwords, depending on if you may chose 15 characters or longer, you don't get those, but pretty much everything else you're going to get. So I was able to crack the majority of these, which gave me greater access to um, the, the passwords for comparison. There wasn't any password expiration at all. People were essentially just allowed to keep their passwords as long as they wanted to or until they ran into a problem that required a password change. And the minimum, believe it or not, the minimum link was three, which that blew my mind, but uh, you know that was their policy at the time. So over that three-year period, looking at accounts that were there for all three years, um, I tried to look at how often do people change their passwords. And so you get some kind of some some figures here around 83, uh, 81, 83 um, percent didn't change their passwords. I think it was 77 percent over the, the three-year period for. Uh, the thousand and some accounts that were there for all three years. So, you know, not terribly surprising. People aren't going to change their passwords unless they have a reason to. Um, I did look at, you know, accounts that had at least two different passwords. And, of course, since these were snapshots in time and not looking at the password history, I was only able to tell that they had a different password from the previous time. They may have changed it ten times in that year's period, but, of course, that's fairly unlikely. Uh, so accounts with at least three different passwords, there was only 4% of the user base that was either voluntarily or for some reason having to change their password. Um, this is also kind of interesting. Uh, the difference between the UNC study and this was for those people that changed their passwords, uh, it may have been more difficult for them to choose something similar to their previous password, depending on the reason for the password change. If they had forgotten their password altogether, of course, that would have been one reason for a change, and there would have been no way for them to um, go back then and, and use something similar unless they remembered it at a later time and, and changed it a third time. Um, so there might have been, you know, that's something I'm interested in seeing as far as how big of an, an impact that has. Um, and I'll come back to, to, to Zulu, but I'm going to introduce Tango here. This is a slightly different end of the spectrum where it was an organization where they had to change passwords every 30 days. Um, very similar in that they didn't have password complexity turned on. They did have a longer minimum length of six characters, um, but otherwise, again, Active Directory was able to crack 99% of the passwords um, that that they had. But I didn't get; I only got one sample. I wasn't able to get um, several samples over time to compare, unfortunately. So if we start by looking at how the how the length compares, and I've got all three years of Zulu up here, but effectively they're they're similar to a point. Um, you can see a couple of interesting things. First of all, that while the minimum length of Zulu was three characters, the majority of people still tended to choose, even though they weren't being required to by software, tended to choose longer passwords. With Tango, 20% of the users chose that minimum of, of six characters. And then it went up to close to 40%, and then about 35%, and before it sharply dropped down um, once you hit nine characters. To me, that, that tends to say that if someone's going to have to be committing to regular password changes, they're not going to come up with some nice, long, juicy password. They're going to say, okay, what's, what's the minimum I have to produce here? Let's get that done and go from there. But it is interesting. The other thing I thought uh, was notable, not really specific to password expiration, but that these people who didn't have that same pressure, they could have chosen three, four character passwords. They still tended not to choose you know, below the, the six and seven character, with eight being the most popular. 
um, password mask comparison. If you're familiar again with password cracking, this is essentially just a way of simplifying, saying, okay, you know, essentially we care about whether it's a dictionary word or name or something, but let's just focus on the format at first. And so these masks represent, represent that format of letters, not that it's a specific letter or a specific number, but how that password is formed. So this is all lowercase letters. This is three lowercase letters followed by three numbers, so on and so forth. So you can see from the third year of Zulu and the third year of Tango, the differences in the masks, and then this also tells you what percent of the total passwords those were. So the first big difference you can note is that, of course, people were using a lot more just, just letters, lowercase letters, in the Zulu environment. And when you look at Tango, suddenly now letters are being appended on 75% of those passwords. And it's usually in the predictable format of something letters plus one number plus two numbers. Um, and while I don't have a lot of the details on it, I do can tell you from just looking at the data, uh, there was a lot of those that were words followed by numbers. So, one hand, it's good that some of these probably were dictionary, or, or definitely are dictionary words, but we're not necessarily buying as much, much else when we are actually looking at, uh, yes, you have to add a number on the end, but the numbers themselves are a little predictable too. This is a little bit busy as far as a bar graph goes, but you can kind of see this is all three years of Zulu and then just one year of Tango. This is of the numbers that those were used in those environments, what the preference was for certain specific numbers. So most popular number was zero in Zulu. Most popular number was one. Or, sorry, Zulu was one and, and uh, zero was Tango. You can also kind of see how, um, for example, the month that I took the Tango sample was in July. So seven has a very high um, popularity. Four as the year, also very popular. So even choices like that for an attacker, um, especially if they're, this is, a, like I said, 30 days, it's very easy to guess that the number is probably going to be associated with the current month or, or the past month, depending on what point in the password expiration they're in. Um, while it's not entirely random, as you can see in the other environment, there tends to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more question as to what it's going to be. So I want to put out more data on that. Like I said, I'm I'm not completely through with my comparison of of uh, which are the more secure, which are the least secure of those two environments. I you know, like I said, that's my suspicion is that there's not being a whole lot bought by password expiration. But I did like this quote from Gartner um, back in 2010 in one of their papers about the risk, uh, what, what's motivating having password expiration in place. And this is the nice version. And then this is the rant version, also from Gartner. This is from their VP, uh, their security practice. Um, but there's a lot of blame being placed on auditors, which I think uh, to an extent is fair because they're the ones that are, that are having to enforce the standards that are on the books or the standards that we've written in our policies. Um, but the reality is, you know, they can only take so much of the blame. Um, we have responsibility as the IT security people to uh, make sure that we're not so risk adverse. We're saying, well, if we turn off password expiration, password expiration um, someone could get this person's password and use it for six months or use it for a year. Um, we have to be willing to accept some of that risk when it makes sense. Not in every case. It's also very easy if you've inherited, if you work in internal IT, if you've inherited policies or practices that came from 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or just to let those stay in the books the way that they are today, unless there's some big pain point, there's not a lot of motivation to go try to fight those battles of getting it changed, going through the audit committees, going through uh, external audit that's going to come in and flag you as flag that as, a, as an issue every time, um, and trying to fight those battles. What I do think is interesting, and what some of those some of the objections, um, like uh, Fred Cohen points out in his paper that one of the areas that password expiration can make sense is in shared password environments, where if you have five people with a service password that they have to share for some reason, it may not be a great practice, but they have to do it, that having password expiration in that place because there's diffused responsibility among those people can actually have some benefits. And especially in smaller environments where they don't have, where you can't sit down and say, do a risk assessment of password expiration, 
having that turned on versus nothing can have benefits in some cases. So again, it's it's not a uh, cut and dry case of get rid of password expiration. It's more of make sure it's being used in the right situations and um, that it makes sense. So has there been a shift? I mean, like I said, there's more attention being given to password expiration, more people going on, writing their opinion that, hey, this is I don't agree that password expiration is great. Um, there's certainly been a number of organizations. Here's a, a sample of a few of them. What's interesting is sometimes password expiration policies are being tied to other password policy changes, such as in the case of Northern Illinois University, where they said, we're going to increase the duration of passwords, but we're also going to increase the minimum length. Um, Stanford changed their password policy earlier this year to say, we're also going to increase the minimum length, but you'll not have to use as many complex characters. So people are kind of tying it into that. I also thought universities are very easy to, to witness this happen in because they typically have published policies that are accessible on the internet. Sometimes they have bulletins that are sent out to their students and teachers. Um, but it is interesting to see that even the U.S. Defense and Finance and Accounting Service uh, announced that they're also increasing the duration of, of how long the passwords are good for. If you remember that OSU story, um, OSU had a 90-day password. Uh, Oklahoma State University had a 90-day password expiration. And I don't know why, but um, they were getting a lot of hatred for it, especially on Twitter. What was kind of funny was this guy, Bob Gribben, in their support department had agreed some, in, some number of years ago to put his name on the password expiration notices that were mailed out to the students and teachers. So he apparently was getting a, a good deal of hate, whether it was serious or not. Um, and this was earlier January of this year. Just last month, OSU announced that they are changing their password expiration from 90 to 180 days. So, which leads me to believe that even though, again, it's not necessarily you know, turning off expiration or getting, making it into a year or whatever, that giving it attention, just bringing it to the forefront and saying, well, why do we have this policy? Does it, does it make sense to have this? In his case, because he was getting negative attention, um, that, that, that sometimes can stimulate discussions about changing the password policies. So what are your alternatives? If you decide, okay, Bruce, I'm ready to loosen up our password expiration or turn it off altogether, what am I going to tell auditors or what am I going to tell my boss or what am I going to tell other people when it comes to uh, what our alternatives are? What else are we doing to try to stop password compromise from having big problems in our environment? Of course, the, the easiest one is to only force changes when compromise is suspected, or if you change your password policy, if you go from seven characters to eight characters, people aren't going to be forced to do that unless they're, you actually stimulate a password change. Uh, but one of the more popular ones that I think is going to start getting a lot more attention is the intrusion prevention coupled with behavioral profiling of users. And there have been products in the market for years, but I've seen a lot more. IBM filed a bunch of patents this year. There's several companies out there marketing these right now where especially for online services, the way you move your mouse or the way you click through applications or the way that you react to certain stimuli fairly within the normal navigation of the application can be used to profile you as a user, especially, of course, coupled with are you coming from Russia, are you coming from China when you normally come from uh, somewhere else. Those types of things can, can uh, kind of complement the password and, and as a way of identifying you. Um, this is always a good one, too, better feedback to users. If you say your last login was from here, or hey, you're sending an email because your password was just changed, these are things that can help users in an intelligent way give us feedback on whether something is happening that shouldn't be happening because someone's gotten their password. And of course, this is easier said than done, but if you have a situation where you're saying, listen, we, we've got to change passwords every 30 days or 60 days because we just can't stand password compromise happening, we've got to try to prevent it in all cases, you probably need to be looking at something multi-factor. And like I said, it's easier said than done. Some systems make that very difficult to implement. Um, but it is certainly something that you should be considering. Oh, I was going to say, to this end, uh, if you want to write a justification for changing your password policy, Texas A&M um, had one, I think, a couple years ago that's out there as a PDF that they wrote up very well, uses a lot of these references, makes you know, this case... Um, I don't have a link to it in here, but if you let me know, I'll certainly send you a link to that PDF and give you a starting place if you're going to try to write that justification. And they actually went into password length and some other stuff too, but password expiration was one part of that. So areas where I'd like to see research uh, needed, of course, because I'm always interested in getting more data, getting some of the information, trying to make better and smarter decisions. Um, 
like I said, we still have fairly limited on what the impacts are. Uh, can you educate users? Like I have to change my password 60 days for one system. My passwords have nothing to do with each other. I use a diceware type system, so it's fairly easy for me to come up with new random, pa you know, random passwords uh, to use every time I have to have a change, and it's not too difficult for me to memorize the new ones. Does that something that's applicable to all users, or is that really something that's only going to be really helping out a certain small portion of your user base? Is there an optimal time? Like I said, 30 days, probably way too often. What about a year? If you make people change their password every year, are they going to move away from that making predictable choices, you know, their old password being related to their new password? We don't really have data on that. Um, and like I kind of mentioned, what are the impacts that awareness can make? This is my niece, Nadja. I had to inform her uh, recently that it was time for her to change her password. That's it. Um, like I said, I hope uh, any, I kind of kind of uh, took a survey at the beginning about opinions on passwords. Anybody's opinion changed? The password expiration? Any new evidence you can use? That's my. That's really my hope. Whether you change your mind or not, at least you have some more information. Um, but feel free to contact me. I hope to. I'll put these slides up here, um, as well as links to some of the, the sources that I had, because I know there was a lot that I covered as far as uh, the different resources in here. Um, but any questions? For those organizations that do store X previous passwords, do you know if any of them are using positive matches on prior passwords as an input to their IDS? So they they would actually be scanning for those strings, like so saying, inbound. In their authentication system, if an attempted uh, uh, okay authorization actually matched a prior password. Right, to flag that as an incident. Do, do, are they feeding that into their IDS as a, pos, uh, a possible signal? Yeah, not that I've seen. I mean, the closest I've seen to that is, I guess, Google will tell you if you try to log in with your old password, that, hey, you changed this 90 days ago. So they're keeping records of that, and we'll do some basic alerting, but that's not really IDS-type things. I don't think I've seen or heard of anybody that's doing that level of, of testing. I think it would be an interesting idea to try out. It would seem like a way of like figuring out, is proactive rotation actually preventing, uh, you know, thinking back to our keynote, the b keynote, you know, as a way of measuring the effectiveness of forced password rotation. That would be an interesting piece of data to find out how often does an old password and expired password sure. try to be used. It seems like something I'd love yeah. someone like you to do for me. Well, I, you know, I'm always, if I have the data, it's usually easier. Um, what I have seen is that's not really specifically related to that is the blacklisting of certain passwords by organizations, of course, that they've, uh, especially um, what's interesting is online games are starting to do that more. Um, Arena, ArenaNet, and uh, I think, um, I can't think of the other game. But anyway, they're, they're basically saying, listen, we've had these million passwords that are constantly trying online against our accounts. You just can't use those anymore. Um, but yeah, not specifically to, to the, uh, that level that you're, you're talking about. Be, I'd like I said, I'd, I'd like to see it. Foreshadowing my own talk, uh, there's a big difference between changing authentication passwords. Oh, uh, there's a big difference between changing authentication passwords and encryption passwords. Um, where, in a sense, you've got one type of password, encryption passwords, that you should very rarely change. Sure. And so we're sending people a signal when we're telling them to change passwords, and then we come across a case where if people extend that advice to those other passwords, they're actually doing themselves a very big disservice. Yep, Jim. Are, are there any are there any great worst case uh, worst practices stories that you have about password changes? I mean, one that kind of occurs to me that I sort of vaguely remember is a site that was checking to make sure that your password was different enough from one of your other ones, which kind of indicated that it must be storing your old passwords in the clear. Right. Yeah. I uh, and that's actually I'm trying to think where. Someone is, you know, I see a lot of the same stuff on Twitter. You probably do, and I try to capture screenshots. It's interesting. I, I know one lady had to change her password after every database login or something. Um, 
It seems like I did see one recently where it was something like uh, someone was complaining that their password was being compared to a previous password, and it was it wasn't a this is the exact same thing. It's this is very close, and that's I mean some systems of course are implemented with reversible encryption or no nothing at all where that can happen. But I don't have a specific company the name or a product or something like that. Yep. All right. Well, so so go to Rick's talk and you'll hear a little bit more about that. There's a website dedicated to uh, resenting every site which stores plain text password and it's called plaintextoffenders.com. Right. And if you go there, you'll see hundreds of our stories. Right. It's so very common. Plain text offenders is a good place to go look at seeing if either report a site you find is emailing you plain text passwords or to go see if one of the sites you use has uh, that, site, that type of a setup. Fundamental. Um, you mentioned using Diceware, mm -hmm. um, which we did to generate a master password for one password, and then we've used it since then to generate passwords, which are very um, quite strong. You know, air quotes. When we're required to change passwords, um, it strikes me as odd that it should be up to us to decide if it's current enough or strong enough or it, it's we're assuming that risk and so that's one part of the question and the other part is our financial institution I just reminded him has never ever required us to change our passwords right. we, we have different uh, logins yeah it's very interesting you'll see uh, and that's a that's a common thing I'll see people complaining about like Pillsbury.com requires stronger password than my bank does or there's just very large inconsistencies in how that's implemented. Even we, we think they salt it. I mean, we think we're doing something to ignore what that base password is. Yeah, but to your first point about password, a person's password feels personal to them, um, and that's a very interesting thing when you think about like one of the very few security controls that. People say, well, I had to come up with it, so therefore it's mine, even though your system required it of me. I should have more control over it. I should be able to choose what I want or should be the length that I want. Um, and it's, in some systems, I think that certainly makes sense, especially lower security stuff. But I wasn't implying that we're smart and we generated it. One password generated it. The site's not happy with because it contains certain well, characters. or Right. They don't know what it is. And they just want to use it. Right. Um, I've, got, I've got just pure speculation about what's going on with the weak password requirements of banks. Um, and I'd love for somebody to actually have solid research and evidence on this. Um, I suspect that they, uh, that they are encouraging weak passwords because they want th their passwords to be unique and not written down or stored in an Excel file, and that they believe that their hashes are never going to be compromised. Right. So that so that they've put their defenses to make sure that their hashes or whatever they're using will never be exposed, and so then they're actually lowering their password requirements on people so that people will pick unique things that they remember. I think he wants to comment on your, your statement there. I hope you've got data. So not that I've ever worked in information security in a bank. Let me throw that. I am not a lawyer. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, two things. One, compatibility with the back end heavy iron that some banks have had for years. The second thing customer comes first. We need to make it easy for them. Uh, they need to be able to get into their bank account. We don't care if it's uh, best practice or not. Yeah, I, I, I actually been in it. Also on those lines, some systems require reversible encryption, so you have that as well. And as far as what you're saying about weak systems, there, you know, there's only a certain number of passwords, a certain number of hashes that will exist in that space, so it, it definitely would not be that. It would, it, you know, because you know, you want to have increase the key space as much as possible. 
So when you leave the business unit making the decision, which is usually probably the head of marketing or business development, what do you think they're going to decision they're going to make? Yeah, I think in some cases too, uh, there's just not, there's not, you know, the, the people that write the banking software aren't getting pressure from the customers that that's a feature that they really want. I mean, I, I've talked with, with um, probably about six or seven different core banking, like this is the foundation of your banking infrastructure, core banking software vendors, and I'm asking them, how are you hashing your passwords? And it's SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-1 with, with salting. It's not what the rest of us are looking at Twitter and Facebook, you know, having better, it's just, they don't think about it. They're not asked by customers about that very often. And so I don't think it's a priority for them. Well, I appreciate uh, everybody's time today. And if you've got any other questions, certainly uh, get in contact. Thanks.